time is running out for both the colonists and for me. The colonists are getting near to death. Um, time is running out for the Cylons in a way too. The colonists are getting near to their destination, the Ionian Nebula. Um, but what's most pressing in my heart is the, the, the time that's running out for me. And that's because tomorrow I need to use this game with a group of real life humans. Granted, I can record the board state if I don't get it done by then, but it would be so much easier, so much less busy work, which is my least favorite kind of work, unless it's like washing the dishes or something else where you can think about other things. I enjoy that kind of busy work um, to get out, to get tangential with you. Um, it'd be so much easier just to, to get it finished. So I took an hour off work. I have a good chunk of time. I feel like we can reach some conclusion for this game, be it positive for the human race or negative for the human race. Alright, let's begin things off before we get into Nine Ball's turn with a quick overview of the dire straits that the humans face. So first of all, these are the only two spaceships they have left uh, to defend themselves. That's going to be tough. When they get to Ionian Nebula, there's an automatic board set up um, where there's going to be some bad guys and they're, they're supposed to have at least four, guy, four defending ships. They don't have those right now. Um, and their fix-it guy, Hubba, is a Cylon, so there's no one who naturally draws blue cards, which are the cards that are needed to repair the damaged Vipers. So that's where they are militarily. Not very good. They also don't have any nuclear weapons because Watermelon had the personal goal of getting rid of nuclear weapons. And so they don't have that to defend themselves with either. So they're, they have these kind of, a, a real strong deficit. Along with that, they are missing Raptors. Um, one reason that's a big problem is I believe raptors are one of the things you can risk in order to get more fuel, which they are also low on. That might be the only thing. I think you send out the raptors to scout for fuel, um, and then you might get it. So they gotta, they just gotta hope that they draw destination cards that don't take any more fuel. They're about to do that. They're getting close to jumping. Um, just one more little symbol. They could decide to jump early if they wanted to. It might be wise. I don't know. Um, Morale is also low. That's their other big problem. So they're looking at not a lot of defense, not a lot of gas, not a lot of morale. Um, on the bright side, they know who the Cylons are, Hubba and Brezza, so they don't they can trust each other. And, and the fact that they're able to work as a team um, might give them a little bit more of an advantage than they had before. However, it feels to me like it might be too late. Uh, Nine Ball used his president's office. That seems to be what he likes to do. He, I don't know. I think he's the only player who hasn't moved the whole game. Uh, so what he did was he assigned a mission specialist, and I think maybe as in part as an apology to Tater for not doing anything to get her out of jail. Um, she was the one he chose. What that does, and that's this is going to be very helpful to the people. Um, to the humans, is they get to, uh, she's going to get to draw three destination cards and pick one on the next jump instead of just two. So that's going to give um, them a little bit more to choose from and hopefully be able to get something that doesn't cost them too fuel like this barren planet. Let's see what his crisis is. Oh, and he gets to choose between two. And the crisis is a water shortage, um, which is going to bring them up the, the jump marker or the jump track which is very good. They're going to be jumping. Um, but first he has to resolve the crisis. Basically he's going to have a choice between losing some food or some uh, skill cards. Food is the one thing they have in abundance. So he's going to go with the food um, reasoning that the skill cards would be more useful later. Uh, Brez is up next and he could cause another crisis or you know there could be other crises where skill cards are definitely useful. Let's jump. And they've made it to the crucial eight. So we're going to go through the crossroads phase, um, which is a whole bunch of stuff uh, relating to these tokens and relating to a bunch of a bunch of things. There's going to be some some guys out here, um, but they jumped into uh, the downside to this is they jumped into a Cylon ambush. There's a si there's a base star here, three raiders here. There's these guys here. I don't know if they get cleared off or not with the, um, since there's some setup involved with the Ionian Nebula. Only lost one fuel. So that means if the humans are going to win, and I don't know if this is possible, they have to draw a destination car that doesn't lose any fuel. I don't know if that exists or not. But um, we shall see. I'm going to read up, set up, and then go bop.
I decided to make a call. It, the book doesn't specify, it's kind of a weird situation where the destination card and the Ionian Nebula both call for um, the setup of units. I'm going to have the Ionian Nebula trumpet trump the um, destination card just because it's it seems more integral to the game it's supposed to be set up in this particular way I could look it up online and find the answer I'm positive but I don't have that time right now so I'm just gonna make the call um, set it up as it is in the Ionian Nebula it's also maybe a little bit more positive for the humans in that way um, the civil there's no civilian ships in the setup I feel like, you know, they're going to be lucky even if, if they scrape by even with that. So, uh, I, but that's not the main reason I did The main reason I did it is because the Ionian Nebula setup feels like a, a more integral part of the game than the destination card. Right, before I continue, let me explain what's going to be happening now. Um, it relates to these little things. So the players have these little markers that are red and blue. The humans don't want red and the Cylons don't want blue. Uh, they each got a crossroads card and it looks like this. So it's got a blue result and a red result and basically if they have that marker they can decide which result they get. Generally the blue results are better for humans and generally the red results are better for Cylons. I think did I get that right? I don't know. Um, but it's their last chance to get rid of a marker. So what's going to happen is um, after they go through and they do the results uh, the humans are going to get rid of all of their blue markers and the Cylons are going to get rid of all their red markers and then whoever has two or less markers after that gets rid of them. So if they're down to two, then they're fine. Um, and then whoever has the most markers is out of the game. Like they've lost, whether their team wins or not. So this is kind of important. Their, their personal life is going to trump um, the kind of group dynamic, which has been the main focus of the game so far uh, at this particular portion of the game. So I'm going to go through that and then I'll reveal what, what everyone's little, um, how their personal stories uh, turned out. It's, it's fun sometimes when you have random cards uh, have personal stories, how appropriate it can be um, because of the way our minds can draw links between things. Alright, so we're starting with President Nineball. Here is his choice. His deal is testimony. Um, he can either be forgiven for giving testimony or be a scapegoat for giving testimony. He chose to be forgiven. Um, so he gets to choose another player. That player discards two random skill cards and may discard two trauma tokens. He, you know, so he wants to hurt the Cylon, right? Um, Brezza only has one trauma token, which isn't going to hurt him at the end. There's no way, you know, if this is blue, he's going to get to discard it anyway. So he's going to choose Brezza. Brezza gets rid of a trauma token and a skill card here. Not too damaging, not too big of a deal. All right. Here we have Brezza. Brezza has a disturbing vision. So either the disturbing vision wasn't real or he's done something horrible. Um, he decided to do something horrible, so each Cylon player draws two trauma tokens, and then the Admiral is immediately executed. So they're going to get two random trauma tokens. He's taking a risk here, but I think he figures it actually, since they're competing to win, um, or to, to go on in the tournament, uh, Hubba has more trauma tokens than Brezza. So if... Hubba could could lose the game and Brezza could still win. He feels like the Silence have a lock, so it, it makes good sense for him to do this. All right, so... And the Admiral is immediately executed, so I'm going to have to go through and do that and then get back to you. Right, moving on to Tater. Tater hears strange music. Um, so it's either nothing but static or she can hear it. Um, she decides it's nothing but static, uh, so she can choose a player and look at all of his loyalty cards and discard one trauma token. <coughs> Not a real big deal there. Um, yeah, who does, does she want to even look at? Uh, I guess she'll look at, at his at hubba's here. She doesn't. The other one was the personal goal. Okay, so that that. Uh, Corroborates uh, Nine Ball's story about that. 
Okay, so here we have Hubba here. Oh, she gets to discard one. She'll discard a red one if she has it. There she goes. Okay. Um, Hubba, did I move what he did? I think I might have moved his thing on there. I gotta read the side. That's right, okay, Hubba committed perjury. He can either gain sympathy or cast aspersions. Um, he chose to gain sympathy, which makes sense. He got rid of a blue token there. He has to discard two random skill cards. That's both of his skill cards. Um, and then discards two trauma tokens. So that's going to help. Let's. Uh, I'm just going to turn them up to look at them. All right, they're all red. There goes some a surprise. So it looks like Brezza's plan did not work. Um, Hubba is not going to be out of the game as a result of those. And then we go down to Watermelon. Watermelon chose a new character because she just got murdered by Brezza. She's now Starbuck, um, which is pretty good for the colonists. Now, now they have a pilot, and she has mechanical skills. I don't know if she's going to be able to handle both of those. She actually had some blue cards that she picked up as Tori here. Um which she had to discard. <clears throat> but that did lower their morale. Having a human die lowers your morale. So I, that's the main reason he did that. He figures, you know, sure they can try to fight, but it's not going to do them a lot of good because the Cylons have the humans in their grasp. I forgot in my um, excitement to... Uh, to do her little trauma thing. It was scanned. She had a choice between ordering a retreat or ordering a an attack. Um, she ordered a retreat because otherwise they'd lose morale and that would be really bad. So that's going to activate all the raiders however and that's also bad. They're heading around clockwise here. Um, but it has the added benefit of, of increasing the jump preparation. So that's probably the most um, Hers was probably the one that affects the game the most, so the current current state. Let's continue with Brezza's turn, see what he's going to do with all this. All right, Brezza is ordering the base stars to fire on the Battlestar Galactica. They, if they get a, where's my little cheat sheet here? If they get a five or higher, um, Battlestar Galactica is going to be damaged, so he's going to shoot twice. That's one miss, and... A hit, so you're gonna draw one of these. I think it's possible they could lose fuel on this. I don't, I haven't memorized what all the damage counters are, but we're gonna draw this one. And this destroys the armory. I made a mistake, this has never happened before, so I hadn't internalized these rules. If there are no civilian ships on the board and they're not in the same, these little raider guys are not in the same space as a, um, as a Viper, they just shoot at Galactica, so um, they're going to roll eight times. They only hit on an eight, unlike the base stars, which hit on a five or higher. Okay, so let's start with one. That's one damage, and we'll just resolve all the damages after they shoot. Two, that's a miss. Three, that's a miss. Four, that's two damages. Wow. That's a miss. Six, that's a miss. Seven, that's a miss. And we'll redo that one. Eight, that's a miss. Now, if this just, if they lose as a result of this attack, I'm going to feel like it's a little anticlimactic. But let's see what we get. All right, so that's the Admiral's Quarters. So, so far, they've damaged two locations that are no, not necessary. I think if six are damaged, however, the Battlestar is gone. And that is food. So they've lost some food. Food goes back into the... Thing, and they can afford to lose food, so we'll continue with Tater's turn. All right, Tater used the CAG action to activate an unmanned Viper, which is one of the two that they currently have, flying it over here to try and mess with these guys so they'll shoot at it instead of the Battlestar Galactica. Um, and also allowed her to give the CAG title to Watermelon. Watermelon can uh, get better use out of it if she can get out into a ship. Unfortunately, they don't have any ships that are available for her to fly in, which is too bad because she's supposedly a great pilot. Let's see what Crisis uh, awaits. All right, so the, the base stars are going to shoot. Um, the Admiral has to choose between uh, morale and population. Uh, yeah, well, I, th I think it's got to be population, right? So Admiral has to discard two skill cards and then lose a population. And the base star shoots. Unfortunately, no movement on the jump track. All right, base stars shoot five or higher. That's a one. Second one. And that's a hit. This one is. 
Where is that? Oh, command. That's that's too bad. That's actually a useful place for them right now. All right, Hava's turn. He is going to have these guys shoot, too. I think they're just going to try and uh, put the humans out of their misery. Again, eight hits. Eight's hit. Eight shots. One. Two. That's one hit. Three. Four. That's two hits. Wow. Five. Six. That's three hits. If all of those are locations, the Cylons win. Seven and eight. So that's not. It's it's an improbable number of hits. Let's see. Let's see. I gotta kind of shuffle them up a little bit. And that is fuel. So that's gonna be the game right there. Um, Battlestar Galactic can can no longer move. Let's see what the other ones are. And that's faster than light control. Someone give me a viper. Oh, where did I put the dial? Five, five. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, that's going to do it, and with plenty of time to spare, I could even get back to work if I wanted, but I've got an hour, so I'm going to do something else. Um, that was a lot of fun. I, you know, I have to say for those of you who haven't uh, tried Battlestar Galactica solo, it actually works pretty well. I think I'm glad I've played it with people, humans. I feel like that informed my play, just to kind of get to see how people... Uh, tend to react and interact in this situation um, or the set of situations that the game provides but I think it's definitely doable having a having the numbers on the board helps um, kind of helps keep me from turning it into a game of me just playing action figures and just deciding what I want to happen happens um, humans got creamed pretty pretty heartily I don't know how they could have pulled it out I'd be, I'm actually interested in seeing what the next two destination cards are I bet you might be as well okay so remember they had one fuel yeah both of their destination cards cost another fuel so even if they had gotten through um, that that uh, field of Cylon uh, Cylon, um, what do you call them, spaceships, they would have still run out of fuel. I think once they got down to two without any raptors, I think it was kind of a foregone conclusion. But I, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of happy with, I, I'm glad they got to the Ionian Nebula. I'm glad they got to have their little personal problems. I felt like they didn't feel super relevant in this case, maybe because they just hadn't uh, accumulated much trauma or baggage by that point that it just didn't it didn't seem like a super hard decision um, you know some people just had one color and that was you know a lot of that was luck but I still enjoy that part of the game I think it's fun especially since and this is something I was thinking about um, in terms of this particular game I haven't I haven't talked too much about the the real people themselves in this game maybe less than others than many um, and I think it's because the game focuses more on the relationships between the individuals rather than the individuals themselves. Or maybe that's just because I had to spend so much time thinking about that because of the whole um, suspicion thing. Like, you know, I, that's one reason I was maybe forgetting the special powers, though. Who am I kidding? I always forget um, details when I play these games. So, solitaire. Um, but it, it definitely focuses in on the relationships between people rather than the people. And I think that's, I, I like that. I think that's helpful. I, uh, I belong to a culture um, that focuses very heavily in the, on the individual um, 
in the individualist portion in a well, it gives lip service to that. Um, while in, I, I, I'm not going to go into that, but <clears throat> I feel like that's that's only one piece part of it. That's only, you know the, a lot of who we are. I don't I don't think we're quite so static. I think um, a lot of who we are depends on who, what we're interacting with, and it's not really a, a matter of who we are in this integral sense, but it's like who we are being, maybe, in a given time. And I think there's an interplay between the individual and um, the, the space between the individual and whoever they're interacting with, or whatever they're interacting with, what items they're interacting with, that um, makes us, allows us to surprise ourselves, I think, or allows us to, to do things we might not do if we were just alone in a room playing a game with some cards. Um, but even that, you know, that brings out a different part of me as an individual than it would otherwise. I'm kind of blathering, but I think that, I think this is a fun game, and I, I, I wouldn't let it scare you in terms of playing solitaire. You don't get that same, like, churning feeling in your gut, or that I don't get that same churning feeling in my gut uh, quite as strong as I would um, if I were playing the game with humans and I look at that card and find out that I was a Cylon and I'm going to have to lie to these people for, you know, the next few hours <laughs> or try to. Um, but you get, a, you get a kind of diffuse sense of that, I think, maybe more similar to uh, you know, if you're reading a book about people lying than lying yourself. You know, you're not, you're not in it in the same way. You kind of have this top down, you know everything that's going on, but you can definitely, um, you definitely empathize with what's going on at the same time. So what happened there? Who's to blame for the human's defeat? <clears throat> I don't know. I, again, I think it's the, it's not one person, it's the, the set of relationships um, involved. The, you know, I think everyone had their good guesses and their bad guesses, um, and a lot of that was driven by the roll of the die, so it's, it's interesting to me that randomness can can come up with something that to me anyway was very um it seemed very legitimate it wasn't it didn't turn out any different very any differently than it would have if had i played this game with actual humans i don't think um you know i definitely create personalities for these people or between me and the cards we create personalities for these people but <coughs> you know a lot of their opinions of each other just came from some some very uh, modest observations on how humans behave in this game and uh, in a die roll. So I don't know what, what that says to you, but that's how it is. Thanks for sticking with Battlestar Galactica. Um, I'm going to have to come up with a two-player game for Hubba and Brezza. I'm actually looking at a game right now. I'll let you see it. This is what I'm thinking might be a good one. Um, this one right here, this is called Cyberpunk. Or Cybernaut. <coughs> Sorry, it's the cyberpunk game, the only one that I really know of. I guess Android kind of is, but this is kind of the classic uh, Shadowrun type um, cyberpunk game. You know, one person's a hacker, the other person's the uh, net security, basically. Um, but what's exciting to me about this game is that it's got two different um, maps going on at the same time, and I always think that's exciting when, when there's... Uh, there's two different levels that, that people are competing on. So there's the real world, which is this, you know, you kind of take a look at it. And then there's this whole um, network system that's, that's going to have all these chits that the security person sets up. And um, the cyberpunk person who has these cool little, little hacker guys um, has to try and go in and steal steel files. So it's got a lot going for it. It's got, well, I haven't played yet, but it seems like it has a lot going for it, and it seems like it might fit. Because, um, you know, I'd, since I do have just two, I'd like to to do a game that's just a two-player game, I feel like, because it, it's rare that I, I have that opportunity. So we'll see what I decide, but that, that looks like what might be coming next in the France leg of the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament.